How's everybody doing? We're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 18 today. We're going to begin at verse 17. That's a little more than Mary Ann just read to you. So if you would, you got to open up your Bibles because we're going to cover a little more than what you just heard. And I would appreciate it if you would join me there. Now, over the past few weeks, what we've seen is King Saul spiraling out of control more and more. Because of his rejection of God and his disobedience to God, God rejected Saul as king over Israel. And this was announced to the king through Samuel the prophet. And meanwhile, David was anointed the next king by Samuel at the direction of God. And what we've seen is God beginning a long process of removing King Saul from the throne and putting on the throne the man after God's own heart, David. We've seen the beginnings of this process, and it will take a long time. And we saw that Saul, Saul, that's a fun sentence. We saw that Saul, Saul. We saw that Saul, Saul, what God was doing, and became suspicious and jealous of David. Now, in all these stories, the Bible has been, and will continue to, show us the difference between a godly person and an ungodly person. It is doing that so we can look at our own lives and determine whether we, not the person sitting next to you, is a godly person or an ungodly person and rectify the situation if we don't like what we find. So we see that a godly person has a relationship with God. And as a result, they trust God. So that person, David in this case, is able to remain faithful and do the right thing in very difficult circumstances. David shows us that trusting God's faithfulness allows us to remain faithful to him. We don't have to be destroyed by the circumstances of life. We don't have to be victimized by the things that happen to us. We can remain steady because we trust that God is taking care of us. And we have seen that the person who does not have a real relationship with God is not able to rely on God. So that person, Saul in this case, is wrecked by the situations in life. They don't really trust God, so they don't trust God when he says some things are right and some things are wrong. So what they do is make up their own way. That leads to sin, disobedience to God. Disobedience from God leads to being separated from God. Saul was rejected as king, and the Holy Spirit left him. That leads to jealousy and suspicion. And what we'll see is that spiral continues more and more out of control and will lead to fear and manipulation in this week's text. We will continue to see this downward spiral get even worse and worse in the life of the ungodly person as we continue through the story. Obviously, the warning of the Bible is to not be the ungodly person, to be the person who has a relationship with God, to be the person who trusts God and relies on him. And over the past few weeks, we've seen one of the most famous stories in all of the Bible, the story of David and Goliath. And I think that if we ask people, that story, the story of David and Goliath, might be one of those stories that people list as when they get to heaven, they want to rewind history and watch it happen. Right? Maybe you think that way. There are certain events that are told in the Bible that at least I think would be cool when you get to heaven if you could put the rewind button, although we don't do rewinding anymore because there aren't tapes. I don't even know what to call it. If you could do the rewind button, go back and watch. You know, watch the life of Jesus. Watch uh, Elijah on Mount Carmel, uh, the flood. Stories like that you might want to go back and watch over, right? The story of David and Goliath might be one of those. I mean, how big was Goliath compared to David? How far was that sling throw? How big was that spear? You know, the word in the Bible that's translated bronze when it talks about Goliath's armor can actually be translated scale. So there are some people that think Goliath came into battle wearing some kind of dragon scale armor. That would be cool to see. But I have to tell you that while there are some stories in the Bible that I want to rewind and watch, the story in this week's text is definitely not one of them. 
I'm not going to rewind this one when I get to heaven. In fact, if we have to watch all the history of the world, this one might be where we're skipping in the next chapter. I'm sure you'll join me when you see why. Uh, verse 17 says, Saul said to David, Here is my older daughter Merib. I will give her to you in marriage. Only serve me bravely and fight the battles of Yahweh. So here we see that Saul offers to give his oldest daughter in marriage to David. And this is what part, what, a part of what David won, sorry ladies, when he defeated Goliath. So you remember that the king was trying to save his own skin to get anybody to go fight Goliath in his place. And he offered a sizable reward for the man who would do that. Now, he offered that sizable reward because he never thought he'd have to pay it out. Because whoever took, up, took him up on the deal would be killed by Goliath. And the offer of his, the hand of his daughter in marriage was part, of the, was part of the whole deal. And even though King Saul didn't expect it, David fought Goliath and won. So now the king is making good on the bargain. But do not think that King Saul is doing this to be an honorable and good man. No, he has a plan in mind. It continues. For Saul said to himself, I will not raise my hand against him. Let the Philistines do that. You see, Saul hatched a plan to take care of David. He's jealous of David, but the people all love him. So it's not going to look good if he kills David. So to get that little usurper out of the way, he's going to let the Philistines take care of it. And he has a plan. But the Bible doesn't tell us what the plan is yet. It says, verse 18, But David said to Saul, Who am I? And what is my family or my father's clan in Israel that I should become the king's son-in-law? So David raises an objection. In essence, he refuses the king's proposal. He says humbly that he's not important enough to become the king's son-in-law. Now, like I said to you last week, some people right here in this story are going to read homosexuality into David. He's refusing the king's offer because he's not interested in women but he's interested in men, like Jonathan. Which sort of falls apart in a little bit when David marries several women and has whole bunches of children. If you read the whole story, that doesn't make sense. What happens here is David is being David. He's humble because he follows God. In David's mind, David didn't do anything special to defeat Goliath. God did. David didn't fight the giant to win the king's daughter in marriage. David fought the giant... Because the giant was defying God. So David refuses the king, and the king can't carry out his plan. Which the Bible hasn't told us yet, but it will. So the Bible says, When the time came for Merib, Saul's daughter, to be given to David, she was given in marriage to Idrael of Mahola. So they married her to someone else. And this is because, of course, there is a certain time of the year where you have to have to, have to marry the king's daughter off. Right? No, that's not right. No, this is part of the plot that King Saul has. She is rightfully David's. That's part of the deal that was made between David and Saul. She was part of the payment, again, for killing Goliath. To give her to someone else, particularly when it comes time for her to be given to David, is an insult to David. And the king is hoping that David will react and discredit himself. But David remains faithful to God. And the story continues. Now, Saul, Saul's daughter, Michal, was in love with David. And when they told Saul about it, he was pleased because now he has a chance to employ his plot. Okay, he's not happy that his daughter's in love with David. He's happy that he tries try his plan again. He says, verse 21, I will give her to him, he thought, so that she may be a snare to him. What a lovely way to think about your daughter. Of course, given what happens later on in the Bible, maybe Saul just knew how his daughter is. So he, I'll give her to her so that she may be a snare to him and so that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. You see, Saul intends to use his daughter to get David killed by the Philistines. Saul is such a great guy. But this is what happens 
when a lack of relationship with God leads to a lack of trust in God, which leads to disobedience, which leads to suspicion and jealousy, which leads to fear and manipulation. And here we are at fear and manipulation. So, the Bible says, Saul said to David, now you have a second opportunity to become my son-in-law. Then Saul ordered his attendants, speak to David privately and say, look, the king is pleased with you and his attendants all like you. Now become his son-in-law. So Saul doesn't only intend to use his daughter in the manipulation, he uses everybody to try to manipulate David into his scheme. This is the path disobedience to God and not being in relationship with him leads us. Trusting our own wisdom and manipulating everybody around us out of fear. And verse 23 says, they repeated these words to David, but David said, do you think it is a small matter to become the king's son-in-law? I'm only a poor man and little known. So once again, David answers out of humility. And I do actually have a little issue with how David responds here. <laughs> I know that in his eyes, God defeated Goliath, not him. So God should get the credit, not David. After all, David said out loud that the reason he fought Goliath was so that everybody would praise God. But to say that you are little known, David, is not entirely accurate. David is becoming a hero in Israel. The women danced and sang his praise. He was well known. But David disciplined himself to remain humble to God here. He turns the praise back to God off of himself. So the Bible says, verse 24, when Saul's servants told him what David had said, Saul replied, say to David, the king wants no other price for the bride than a hundred Philistine foreskins to take revenge on his enemies. Saul's plan was to have David fall by the hands of the Philistines. So first off, ew. Second, here is Saul's plan. This is the plan that Saul has been trying to get David into this whole time. He wants to manipulate David into being killed by the Philistines. So he doesn't demand a large sum of money as the bride price for his daughter. Of course, it should be pointed out that David had already paid a pretty hefty bride price. It was 10 feet tall, had heavy armor, had a giant spear, a giant sword, and a giant javelin. That's a pretty big price. So I think it seemed to say that he paid a giant bride price already. And saving the king's life as well. That should have been price enough, we could say. But the king says he doesn't demand a bunch of money, just a hundred Philistine foreskins. Now, this is an odd choice for wedding ring. And if you don't know what this means, ask your mom or dad, and mom or dad, if you don't know, you always have Google. But for the purpose of the sermon today, without going into too much detail, let's just say that the Philistines would not voluntarily give them up. So in order for David to deliver on what the king asked for, David will have to kill a hundred Philistines. Now, that in itself may not seem a horrible task for David, but killing a hundred men in battle comes with a lot of risk. In addition to that, the Philistines would quickly learn what David was harvesting after the battle. And like other Canaanite people, the religious practices for the Philistines often involved fertility rituals. So the Philistines would not just be after David for killing a hundred men, but also for desecrating and mutilating the bodies of the fallen in a way that attacked them religiously. The king's request would make David the most hated and reviled man in all of Philistia. This was the king's plot, hatched out of fear to make David so disgusting to the Philistines and so hated by them that they would do everything they could to kill him. But the Bible says, verse 26, when the attendants told David these things, he was pleased to become the king's son-in-law. 
So before the allotted time elapsed, David and his men went out and killed 200 Philistines. He brought their foreskins and presented the full number to the king so that he might be king, become the king's son-in-law. Then Saul gave his daughter Michal in marriage. So the king's gambit does not work the way Saul wanted it to. David does become the most hated man by the Philistines for killing and mutilating their corpses, but they don't kill him. In fact, David over-delivers on the price asked for. 200. Double. Now, personally, this is not the place I would overachieve. <laughs> and David is married to the king's daughter. Now, being married to my call may still be for David, like Saul said, a snare. A negative thing on his life, because the, as we'll see later on in the story, she's not the most fun person to live with. And the book of Proverbs says that it's better to live in the desert or on the corner of a roof or with a constantly dripping faucet than with a quarrelsome wife. But even so, the Bible says in verse 28, when Saul realized that Yahweh was with David and that his daughter Michal loved David, Saul became still more afraid of him and he remained his enemy the rest of his days. So Saul looks at the situation. He sees that God is with David. He sees that his plot to kill David didn't work. And to make it worse, Saul has now given David another legitimacy to claim the throne by. Now, not only is God with David, not only does the crown prince support David, not only do the people love David, but now he's also married to the royal princess. So, Paul, so Saul becomes more afraid of the man who could have been his biggest ally and views him as an enemy for the rest of his life. And this is what happens when we abandon relationship with God and don't live for him. Where there is no relationship with God, there can be no trust in God. And without trusting God, we end up like Saul. Suspicious, jealous, fearful, plotting. This is where manipulation comes from, from fear. If you look around at the world, it seems like there is so much plotting and manipulation. Forget that. If you look around at Christians... It seems like there is so much plotting and manipulation, and it all comes from fear, from a lack of trust in God. And for the thousandth week in a row, the voice of fear is not the voice of God, but it whispers or screams to us that we have to look out for ourselves. God isn't there looking out for me, so I've got to look out for myself. That is why people scheme and manipulate. Self-preservation rooted in fear. And the only way to escape fear is to run to the arms of God. Fear comes from knowing what something else is capable of doing to us. So if there was a lion in this room this morning, you'd be afraid because that lion is capable of mauling you to death. You might fear other people because they are capable of stabbing you in the back and letting you down. You might fear being vulnerable with someone else because they're capable of betraying you. Fear comes from knowing what that other thing is capable of doing to you. That's why God is the only escape from fear. That's why David wasn't afraid of lions or bears when he was watching the sheep. That's why he wasn't afraid of the giant. It's why he wasn't afraid of 100 or 200 Philistine foreskins. It's why David seems to be afraid of nothing, and Saul is afraid of everything. Because David trusted God, and Saul didn't. And fear comes from what that other thing is capable of doing to you. So without God, Saul is at the whim of every enemy against him. 
It's why he's suspicious and jealous and manipulative. He has to be afraid. He has to watch out for himself. He has to scheme and manipulate and plot because he is all he has. But David knew that with God with him, there was nothing that anything was capable of doing to him that God didn't allow. And David trusted that whatever God did allow was for his good. So there was no reason to be afraid because nothing could do anything to David that God did not ordain. So there was no reason to fear. The difference is trusting God. The difference is having a relationship with God. So the question for us is, will you be like Saul? Fearful? Suspicious, jealous, manipulative? Or will you be like David and rest in the loving arms of God, trusting him to take care of you? If you trust God, there is nothing to fear. But if you feel like you're all on your own and you have to look out for yourself, stop listening to that voice. It is the enemy speaking to you through the voice of fear, feeding you lies. You are not alone. God has said over and over that he will never leave you and never forsake you. And even when you're faithless, he'll remain faithful. God is waiting for you to turn to him and run into his loving arms. Today, stop the scrambling. Stop the panicking. The jealousy, the suspicion, the, 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 the false faces we put on. Stop the manipulation and the lies. Stop listening to the voice of fear. The only way to escape fear is to run to Jesus. He is the way. Trusting him is the answer. So today, step into relationship with him and trust him.